Hello and welcome back to CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. We're uh, on day two of week uh, seven, and uh, we've got, uh, we've segued over to our game aspect of the class. And we're gonna see that relatively quickly, we can create some interesting games. Now, as I've said before, we're not going to create uh, an RTS game or a big old RPG game or anything like that, but it'll be a fully interactive game based on your ideas, based on your efforts. It's going to, going to be uh, basically a continuation of your movie. The movie project you're currently working on, most of you, you know, 30 seconds on the one hand is a lot of work to do to animate 30 seconds. On the other hand, 30 seconds is so short, I can't finish telling my story. Well, the continuation of the story is going to be this game. And this type of game that we're making, it's a point and click adventure type of game where there's a screen full of interactive content on the screen. And then you tap on this to open this door or you pick up this item to put it into this key. It's that sort of style, maybe assistance, you can help me. What are some analogs? What are some examples of, of this type of genre uh, where you're interacting with the screen? I take it more because I'm an old school gamer. I take it more like the classic Sierra games or the LucasArts games, the, those old ones like Day of the Tentacle, Escape from Monkey Island, uh, The Dig, uh, Sam and Max. Uh, those old types of games where Maniac Mansion, where there's an where there's a screen, uh, interactive screen elements, and then you can interact with what's there. It's not like a fast paced kind of game. It's a little bit slower, more contemplative. So I'll show examples from previous students to see what they put together, and let's see how easy this is to show. So I will open up there. FLA file submitted. Oops, I need to reinstall. Okay, so that's one thing to remember. You need to reinstall in the lab here. You need to reinstall the SDK. Obviously, when you do this at home, you just do it one time and then it works. But I need to remember to do that as soon as the class starts. Just one moment. They'll open up this example from a previous semester. It's It's been a while. The class is usually taught once a year. So I don't remember how their game was, but let's see. Let's see if we can easily play this. So control test the movie on just the simulator. So based on what you've been learning, drawing with animate, there should be music playing as well. I don't know if it's louder than my voice. Usually the zoom sound is louder than my voice. Tell me if the zoom if the if the audio on zoom is too loud so cemetery quest uh, i need to turn on touch capability here there's music okay there we go so uh there's this the, the game volume is louder um i think for the moment i'm going to turn off the sound just so that it doesn't conflict with my voice so just one moment right there so there's a starting screen. Now you can have these screens that are static or interactive. This one's static. You've got your character, you've got to play and you've got to help. So if I tap on help, remember this is all going to be happening on real devices. I tap on help. How to play. Your last rite of passage has you venturing into the royal graveyard in order to retrieve the sword and shield of a long dead king. Tap and drag objects in order to use them. Use the environment to your advantage. I can go further look at credits. Okay, cool credits, return, I'm gonna start to play. So here's the very first scene. Okay, so this heirloom should be in the Royal Mausoleum. I think I see east of here. So you can program it in various ways that things are tappable, things are pick upable. Um, and such. So go next. <laughs> Please bury my body, uh, point and click adventure game. So I tap next, I'm trying to go next, screen. Um, then a ghost appears and the ghost is uh, hovering and transparent and such. And then a new grave appears and the grave is glowing. Okay, what do I do? I'm trying to go forward. You can't leave without helping me. So whoops, the ghost ate your soul. And now that it got a taste of one, it will want more. 
So I'm interacting with my environment. I trigger something in that, okay, you can't proceed until you bury the body. So there's a grave here. There's a shovel over here. The shovel is movable. Probably you want to use the shovel on the grave. Right, so, so I've dug the grave. I've tapped one object onto another. There's hit detection going on. Now, I guess there's a body here. And so the same sort of thing. Uh, should I put it near the um, gravestone? Nope, that's not right. Should I put it near that? Nope, that's not right. Should I put it here? Yep, that's probably the right place. So now that that's happening, I should be able to proceed. Should be able to proceed. Didn't do it. Okay, uh, what, what did I miss? Let's try that one more time. We go next. I go to open. I go to here. Oh, I know the, the dirt, right? I need to get the dirt. Okay, the shovel and the, and the dirt. There we go. Logic. <laughs> Hidden object mystery point and click game. That's another version of this type of genre, perhaps. All right, so logic of it. Um, I picked up an object. So behind the scenes, it's programmed that you can select an object, touch it against another object. There's hit detection going on. And if hit detection is detected, something happens. If hit detection isn't detected, something else happens. So I had to do uh, a few clicks and drags and the, and the like. So, okay, I got it. Next. So I have these various paths. Ooh, there's another thing back there, maybe. Is that a rock that I can interact? This is part of the, the fun of things about setting yourself up with uh, what is on the screen to interact with. Now, when I finished my part of the quest on the previous screen, I clicked next arrow and it simply took me to the next screen. I could have, it could have been programmed to see the night in a walk cycle, walk across the screen. The thing about the interactivity that we're learning is now we have this capability to stop and play animation. We have this ability to interact with the environment with the tap of the finger. And everything that you've learned so far can be applied plus the coding we're going to learn. Now, I have an obvious arrow here. Maybe there's a path over there too. What if I tap over there? Nothing seems to happen there. I tap over here, nothing seems. I tap here, okay, probably something will happen when I try to go to the next screen. It just went. So it could have been programmed to see the, to see the, uh, the walking. Uh, this is a little hard to read here. Gravekeeper's house, tree trunk, Mary B. Hughes, Timothy Hughes. I tap on these things. If I tap on the um, sign, Gravekeeper Hughes residence, okay. Reading on that, reading that. Here lies Mary B. Hughes, the love of my life and so forth. Can I tap that door? I tapped on the door and I'm in the house. It's dark in here. Maybe I can use the tinderbox on the table to light the candle. Now, the uh, text box is kind of in my way and this particular person's game is very RPG-ish in that you've got this text box that appears. Of course, you're not required to do that. This just happens to be the first one that I've shown. But this is a popular thing that people do. They put a text box that appears when you click on things. These are basically layers showing themselves. These are basically navigating in the timeline. I will show the game file in a moment. When you play the game, it just works and such. But to get it to work programmatically within your timeline, within your scenes, etc., that is um, what we're going to be learning. I wanted to tap on the Tinder box, I guess, but this is kind of in the way. I tapped somewhere. I, I wanted to see if I could close that, but then I'm proceeding with the game, I guess. Let's see if I tap again with just here. Please give me proper burial. Tap again. Sigh, off to a great start. Okay, so there we go. So it disappears. Tinder box. This is probably movable. Yep. So I guess I'm going to touch the Tinder box to the candle. There we go. Ooh, a zombie. <laughs> Wait, what's that on the table? Tap the box, uh, tap the text box to make it disappear. There seems to be some sort of spell maybe that I'm gonna learn. Oops, I didn't do it fast enough. Um, there was a time limit applied here. You can program in a time limit. 
it'd be nice if there was a clock ticking down or the candle ticking down or something. These are the things that when you play someone else's game, they thought of everything or hopefully they thought of everything. Here, it would have been nice that I see an actual time limit. I was talking to all of you and then I died because I didn't do the thing fast enough. It would have been nice. The time limit is that the zombie's coming closer and closer to you. So there's lots of ways to program these things, of course. This is kind of one of the more advanced ones I'm remembering now. So, okay, I play, I go next. Oh, there was a body there. I never even saw it because I never thought about closing the, the. Um, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't even think about that. Uh, okay, so next, move that over there. that over there, move that there, and then eventually this does get, see that those text boxes should have been programmed also with a little icon, close, because I didn't think about closing it. Okay, I'm not going to go in the house this time. Yeah, let's go in the house actually. So let's see if we can get it working. So move that there, then move that there, or move that there, move that there, there we go. So somehow that spell or something torched the Zombie, I guess. Yes, this is movable there. Tap on that. I, I have to do something here. Close that. Maybe a lot of people are probably going to bite off more than you can chew in that you have these great ideas with a limited amount of time. So once again, with the actual assignment requirements. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll put the assignment requirements out in class this week, maybe next week. Not that you have the stress of already it's due, but to show you here's what I'm going to be looking for, which of course you're going to learn how to do. And if you at least do the things that I'm looking for, you'll probably get a good grade. This seems to have been some sort of idea that never was completed. So, or maybe I have to memorize that red, blue, purple, green. Let's, let's memorize that. Close that. Try to go to the exit. Yeah, exit. What if I try to go back? The whole thing's going to re reset. Fine. So it wasn't programmed to remember I've already been here. So that whole part plays again. Just that's fine. It's this gaming is complicated. So let's say I go forward. Oh, here we go. So, okay. I read the note. Do you remember what the note was? Red, green, purple, blue. Was that it? Or maybe I can go back and have to fight the zombie again. So I probably have to tap these in the order that, that the note had it. Tap that. Nothing happens. Tap that. The door won't budge. The plaque to the left says only the royal family and gravekeeper Hughes are allowed inside. So what if I tap green first? Okay, so if I tap that, then it fully starts up and now I got to put these in the right order. So anyone remember what the order was? I think it was that one. And then I think it was that one. I think it was that one and that one. So nothing bad happens if you do it wrong. But if you do it right, Red was first, or we can just go back and battle the zombie again. Red, blue, purple, green. Red, blue, purple, green. Red, blue, purple, green. Got it. Now, again, when you play a game and there's sound and movement and animation and feedback and all of that, it has to be thought of and programmed or animated. Here, it would have been great that some thing further popped up to show me, yeah, it worked, but it just, the code detected something correct and then it just proceeded to the next place. So, okay, proceed. So I'm here with, okay, there's the thing. And I tap that, you have done it. Now to smite evil. And then it's, oh, obviously it's not gonna be an 80 hour game that you're gonna program here. This took a few minutes. 
There's the trial and error of dying a few times. It's not programmed to permanent death. Oh, you died too many times. Game over. I could play several times. Go back and do it again. Is there a, is there a quest too? Nope, it's still the same game. And that's fine. But it's doing all the things that I'm going to be looking for in the game that you're going to learn, the programming that you're going to learn. And a lot of the effort, of course, will also be the design of it. There's going to be the programming of it. And we've got the code snippets that'll help us, as well as things that are not a snippet that are a little bit beyond a snippet. It's all going to be recorded. I'm going to put the example code on Canvas. You'll have all the pieces to be able to succeed. Uh, your your time limit of it all is is uh is going to be what's what's there i highly recommend that even though our deadline for our animation is still on the 30th i highly recommend that you finish your animation this week by the 23rd so you can start to focus on the game part of things in the game you're also going to make a bunch of different screens you can take some of your screens from your movie and put them into your game. But now you're gonna have to go into the mode of, okay, I need to create interactivity. I need to create code. Some of it will be from code snippets. Some of it will be original code. One example there, kind of to break down the project a little bit for this particular student. All of these various screens are seen. So they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. They have 12 scenes. A scene in this case, for example, the title scene is one screen full here. And in this case, there are all of these layers. There's also apparently a layer of night copy for some reason. I guess they wanted to animate the night and they never did because ran out of time. And notice each body part of the night is its own layer to animate it. That's one way to animate. Frame by frame animation is another way. So they never worked with that one, I guess. There's a background layer, which is that part of the background. There's the gate layer, trees layer. So a lot of different layers to possibly future animate. They never ended up animating. The point of separating things to their own layer is to animate things on their own. Maybe the trees could have been rustling in the wind a little bit. Put it on its own layer in order to animate it. Never got to that point, ran out of time. That's fine. I still get a scene here this look, that looks interesting. It's the name of the game or the name of the game there. And um, you might not be able to do everything that you wanted in your idea, but at the very least, you do what's required of the assignment. Yes. And then a layer of actions, a layer of code. Taking a quick look at the code. So all of these codes that we will be learning, music, playing music, uh, music aspect of things, uh, when the game starts, do something, when, um, when you press a button, do something else. So here's something, this is similar to what we saw previously on Wednesday. There's something to interact with. We're gonna listen for an interaction. There's gonna be some kind of event, either click or tap. When it detects that we've clicked that button on screen, run a, run a, a chunk of code called function or fn go help. The definition of go help is right here which is go to and play my scene help. Now, how do I know it's a scene? When you do this programming, there's code that is built in that you must type it the way that it's invented. And there's code that you invent. Add event listener is built in and must be typed exactly the right way. Touch event is, pro is built in and must be typed exactly the right way. Notice capital T, capital E. Function is another reserved word that is typed in exactly as it should be. Then you've got these other words that we invented, that we add as, as, as original code. For example, this button title screen help and SC help, SC short for scene. So this is basically saying 
all of this first part here is basically saying from the current screen that we're at, go to and play something else. The something else is frame one of your scene called scene help. So by, attaching, by tapping the help button, go to my scene that is all about help. If instead I tap on the, um, the play button, run code called go crossroads, go to crossroads or start game or whatever I want to call it. The definition of that is right here. From the current view, from the current scene, from the current frame, go to somewhere else. And the somewhere else is frame one of my scene, Crossroads, my very first actual game scene. They were testing a little bit of the code here. Well, what if I make it do this? What if I go directly to the house? Sometimes as you're doing this game programming, you don't want to go here, then here, then here, then here to test my seventh thing. You maybe want to temporarily change your code so it goes directly to the seventh screen. I don't need to go through six screens as I'm testing this. I've got time limit. I've got stress. I've got stuff to deal with. I don't want to play my game through seven screens to get to the eighth screen. I will temporarily program in, take me to my next screen. And so this, as we learned last time, the double slash creates a comment. And now here, this button does two things, which is wrong. One button should not do two things. But I can then say, OK, turn it off so that instead of going to my first game screen, I go to my third game screen. This is just, I'm letting you know that the, um, the programming of it all is uh, a lot to consider. So if I did click the help button, it's going to take me to my help scene. And in my help scene, I've got some text. Or, um, oh, here it is. So, on the help scene, they did this, they did two things here. They have two frames. On frame one, the how to play. On frame two, credits. Within one scene, there's two views. We had from scene one, go to and play, scene help. But the first thing in the code is stop. Don't automatically play frame two of help scene stop on frame one. And on frame one, we program the event listeners, listen for tapping the return button, listen for tapping the credits button. If they do tap the return button, okay, run some code. And here there is the, um, there is a conditional statement about making a choice. Uh, based on what screen I'm on. Again, I'll, I'll, we'll be doing this by hand as these lessons go on. I'm just showing an example of someone else's game. But what they've done here is this is how you can make a decision. And they're saying, okay, are you currently on frame one or frame two? On frame one is this um, help screen. Frame two is the credit screen. It's checking, am I on the help screen or the credit screen? If I'm on the, um, if I'm on the uh, credit screen, go back to the in instructions. If I'm on the credits, go back to the title. If I want to go see the credits, I'm waiting to press the button, go to credits, run some code that says, uh, go, to, go to the credits. Now this one, notice, this one is, this syntax over here is saying, go to a specific frame comma of a specific screen. This one doesn't have a frame number. It assumes it's the current scene. So goes to frame one of scene SC title screen. This one. And scene, go to frame label credits. So this one's a go to and stop. This one's a go to and play for various reasons. But what this one is doing is if I'm on frame one 
of my of my help scene and I tap on the credits button, it goes to and stops on frame two. And what's on frame two is a little bit to read. There's a return button. If I tap return, it comes back to frame one of help scene. If I press return here, now it's gonna return back to frame one of title screen. See this navigation to show the various screens, I'm jumping to scenes or frames. I am detecting when a button is pressed to do things. Let's say instead I go to play. So play is takes me to the crossroads. This is made up of all of these frames right here, all of these layers. Let's see, layers. You, you should name your layers. Now, some of these layers seem to be empty as well. You know, make sure you clean up your, your project so you're not, you're not working with things and taking up memory and so forth. There was a layer three, layer four that doesn't do anything. These probably should have been deleted. There's the action layer with the code. Remember, actions, capital A, at the very, very top is common for you to do and recommend it so you quickly find your code. There's a layer folder. We didn't really talk about layer folders too much in class, but looking at it, it is a way to organize a bunch of pieces of layers because the night is made out of a bunch of pieces. If it was gonna be animated to do stuff, each piece based on tweens and such should be divided into pieces so that it probably moves. They never animated it, ran out of time, that's okay. But the idea was eventually animate the night. There is a layer for the hole, there's a layer for the ghost, the gravestone text, the navigation buttons, the corpse, the shovel, the gravestones, the background. So all of these are divided into their own layer. I recommend you divide things into their own layers. Everything is happening on one frame. It is showing and hiding things. There's no extra stuff happening there. But then it's about the code. Let's see what the code say. And notice the code can get very complex. This is 200 lines of code on one game screen you can easily end up with thousands of lines of code. Now, the good news is it's basically going to be like five commands that we're gonna use over and over. Um, and then you apply them in different ways. So it's not like we need to learn 200 commands, 200 codes. It's gonna be like five codes that you're gonna use over and over. Let's see about breaking this down a little bit. Uh, I'll skip all that at the top for the moment. Stuff about music. You can program it to play music, not just waiting for it to play on your timeline. You can program it to play music based on based on um, what you click on via music. We'll learn that in a little bit. First of all, there's a stop. If you don't put the stop, that's one of the first important codes to add. If you don't put a stop, it's automatically gonna play one, two, three, four, five frame, go to my next scene, zoom through that, loop back to the beginning. So basically every scene is gonna start off with a, um, is gonna start off with a, uh, with a stop command. And to have, this sort of code over and over. There's something to interact with. Let me show this. Uh, instance names. That shovel that I want to interact with in order for the JavaScript to detect that that is being clicked on or interacted with needs an instance name. We saw a little bit about that on um, Monday when we had our little simple animation thing happening. We had a button to start the animation and when we applied the snippet, it said, you should usually name your objects. We'll do it for you. Well, I don't want it to do it for me. It'll just give it a random number. I want to give it a meaningful name. So notice here, this movie clip, this copy of Shovel in my library, I've got all of these assets, all of these pieces of things. And so from the Shovel object, I put it a, a copy of it on the screen, and then I've given it a name, Shovel underscore MC. This is a movie clip. It's a shovel. It's got an instance name, and then now the code says,
level when it detects listen for an event, listen for interactivity. What's the interactivity? I'm dragging it. It's a little bit different than the other one, where it's just if I tap it, do something. This is if I drag it, do something. I'm waiting for it to detect a hit state. Did I move this shovel to the right place on my screen? Did it um, interact with the specific target? When I let it go, then I'm checking, did the interaction happen? Yes, no, if else, we'll learn this in a little bit. Um, did we, uh, the hole and the dirt got moved and all this complex this is one of the most advanced ones. I'll show you other examples of people too, but um, the, uh, as, a, as I'm looking at it again, I remember now, this is like one of the ones that's the most advanced. Uh, this is doing things a little bit beyond maybe um, that would make sense with what we learned, but I'll show more examples. And so the code is there about X and Y coordinates. Where is the shovel? Move it around. Is it detecting this and that? Load up the dirt, set some text on screen and so forth. So pretty advanced there. And we're going to see this over and over that it's all of these various scenes with bits of code. If I'm on the outside, if I'm on this here, it looked like they also had the idea they wanted to do several things here, which didn't, didn't, which were not completed, which is fine because we have here, what else? We have a shield and sword and a zombie. Ooh, at one point, they were actually going to have a zombie here to battle, maybe. Maybe after you got the sword, you're going to come back. They never finished programming that. That's fine. This is a very ambitious and advanced game for the amount of time that you have in one summer to do it. Maybe if I reach out to them now a year later and ask them, how'd your game go? Now they've got like 10 levels. I should do that. But they had these ideas that eventually, see they, the rock is on its own layer because they probably wanted to do something with it. Maybe on the first version, there's a creature in the way. You have to pick up the rock and throw it at the creature. Um, there's another path that was never programmed. That's fine. And then the code simply says, oh, okay, let's just go to the next scene ran out of time to, to do that. So when we're at the house, when we're on the house scene, we have two possibilities, go in the house, go to the right, and then the code represents that. Read the sign, read that grave, read that other grave. If you press the, if you press the door of the house, go to the uh, mausoleum, I guess, go to the mausoleum, Oh, I see. Uh, go into the house here. If you press the house door, go into the house. If you go to the right, it's going to take you to the mausoleum scene, the outside of the mausoleum. So you go to the mausoleum with its own code and such. So let me open up another example. This one happened to be uh, an, ex uh, an example that had a lot of detail. Let's look at some other ones. I'm gonna play this without sound just so that I can narrate. So we have some animation happening before anything. You could program, oops, they didn't, they didn't properly program that. They didn't program the part about stop. See, it's, it's all interacting on its own. This is kind of wrong. Um, this is the part about that's frustrating about game design. They focused a lot on the graphics, amazing graphics. They didn't put the extra care for the programming of things, and now this game is gibberish. This is an F. Not grading on the artistry, that's an A+. I love the artistry that is happening here. The idea is cool. This is an F because the game doesn't work. As soon as I load it up, it's already doing its thing. So somewhere there was a misspelling and the game just doesn't work. Oh no, first stone used this clone trick, tap the real one. Again, this is not even a working game, so I'm not bothering. But if I go into it and they're just naming them scene one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, again, 
name your things properly so you can properly code them. That's probably an error. That's why it probably doesn't work because they spend so much time on the artistry, which is important. But what's more important for the second big project is that it works. If it's stick figures on a black and white background, amazing, A+, plus. if your code works. If it's amazing characters with cell shading and gradients, but your code doesn't work, F+. Plus. I'll be nice. I'll give you a plus on that F. But the code, um, no code, this is an F. You know, I don't care that you spent all of this time making your perfect animation and everything. If your code is not doing anything, that's not what this project is about. To make it look nice, it's about to make it do things. So maybe they had the plan that eventually you got the diamond. But the plan falls apart if you didn't do the code part. It's like building a beautiful building on quicksand. You don't have a foundation for that building to stand. Therefore, the building sinks. So yeah, there's nothing to look at here. Unfortunately, code-wise, a lot of nice, beautiful scenes and art and such. <laughs> Good ending, bad ending. But um, no programming, so GG. Let's see the next one. Now, the great thing about Adobe Animate, you can start it all set up with uh, stick figures, literally. And then once the coding is done, go back in and upgrade those stick figures. If you're doing it right in terms of separating things onto their own layers and you're using library symbols, you could start with, well, there's the one about the bunny um, and the carrot. You, you could start with a stick figure rabbit. And when it's a symbol, great. I'm going to later on go into it and then actually animate it or draw it or whatever so that it looks better than just stick figures and the, uh, and the game isn't... Uh, it, you don't get a bad grade in terms of that the uh, coding works, but visually it's not as polished. That can be added later. So let's see if this one works. Test this game. Touch controls, remember to activate here. You have to do it every time. You go to touch gesture, you turn on touch layer. Now you can interact. Obviously, if I'm using this on a real device, even better. I'll go also to help first. Click and drag, locate and capture the intruding bunny. Good luck. So I got my instructions on how to play. There's, you could be more obvious. You could say here, you could have a cool story. Some people write a story like the knight must capture the sword and here capture the bunny. Well, you should, you could also write in here about some things are, some things are clickable. Some things are draggable. Some things you might have to try over and over. You can give further actual instruction on how the game works, not just a story. Back to title. There's an empty spot over here. Is this clickable? Can I interact with that? Nope. I'll play. Sound of the game, it's outside. So I tapped on something, but what else? Tap on that, okay, there we go. So that opened up. Hey, put it on the hay. All right, so there. It's just that one object is interacting with another object. Nothing really happens, but just there's interaction. I can go to the right, I can go to the left. Uh, let's go to the right. I had to tap that one a couple of times and it opened up. Then there's a horse. I tap on the horse. I tap on the horse, it neighs or whinnies or whatever that term is. There seems to be a rabbit back there. Can I tap the rabbit ears? Can I tap the, oh, I can, the whole thing? 
oh, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, that happened a little too fast. It wasn't bunny ears. It was an angry chicken. Let me play that again. Now that I know what I'm doing, play that. I see some movement happening over there. Let's go in the barn. I know to go over here. Tap it a couple times. It was just, it was stuck, but now I can open it. So there's the rabbit, right? I, I think on this, uh, as you program these things, as you program these things, you will see that in your mind, this gameplay is amazing. And when you then have people play it that have never played it before, you're going you're gonna to find out, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or, oh, this doesn't make sense. Because I might return here and think, okay, is there a way to actually properly get through the screen? Do I go through the... Do I go through the um, through the window? Is there something to do here? I probably have to go back. But a lot of times what people do, <laughs> as soon as I let it go, something will happen, I bet. Yeah, so it wakes up and kills me. So uh, a lot of times you're working on your own project solitarily and in your mind, everything's working. Get people to check out your project as you work on it to then give you feedback about this doesn't make sense. What do I do here? This is not too obvious. I never thought about doing this or that. Um, you yourself only working on a project will give you a blind spot. So there's really nothing to do on that uh, spot here. It's just that, oh, there's a, it's a dead end scare. Uh, it's a dead end. So I, I'm going to go back. Actually, can I go back? No, I guess they didn't program to go back. Yeah, okay. I guess this is, a, this is a dead end that you definitely will die. I can't, can I throw, actually, can I throw that up there? Nope, it still comes to life. So that's definitely a dead end screen. Second playthrough. Okay, I'll go up. So what do we have here? Box on top. How did I know to interact with it? Well, play video games long enough and everything is something to interact with. Carrot. Carrot in the milk. What happened? And then <laughs> that happened a little fast. So something happened. I want to catch the rabbit. Oh, I, it makes sense now. I, I put a box to trap the rabbit. And then I put a carrot there and then catch the rabbit, I guess. Let's play that one more time. Again, this is not going to be a 20 hour game. I'll put that on the ground. Okay, so this time I, I put it down, the carrot, the carrot got eaten, and then the bunny runs away, I guess. Go back down, go back up. Again, the programming of it all, for it to detect, you already did that. It's more programming. It's, it's all complicated. Okay, so what if I put it there, it's coming, then I get the box and put it there. Yeah, I got it. And then the head of the... <laughs> The head of the fox was never animated, so it looked like some weird blob. But I won. That had that had a couple of things going on. Hit detection of if this carrot touches the floor, play animation for the rabbit to move onto the screen. Have that rabbit pause there for a moment. If you then pick up the box, hit detection onto the rabbit, you get the good game. If you don't do that within the time limit, play the animation of the rabbit getting away. So it did its thing. Breaking down the game a little bit. So for the moment, I'm kind of spending time on showing other people's games, little preview of the code. Basically, everyone is going to use the same code. I'm going to provide you with the actual code and um, explain the code and so forth. 
notice how everyone's got the same idea of interacting, moving through various screens, but then how it looks like and what it, um, what details it has is all up to you. Everyone will get the same amount of code and the like. So on this first welcome screen, we've got it, a few layers, a layer for the code for the actions, a layer for the title of it, for the buttons, for the actual barn. So on this screen, Got these codes in the background, stop it so that it doesn't just play automatically like runaway freight train. We've got, there's a button that will be tapped on. Once we tap it, do something. The something is go to some other scene. In short, you're gonna see again, the same code over and over. If you get it working right once, then the, um, it will properly work. Actually, since it's about uh, break time, actually, I'm getting a call. Um, I'll finish breaking this down in a moment. After the break, I'll, br I'll break this down a little bit more. Then we'll start to actually put the project together today. We're not going to focus a lot on the code. We're going to focus on the various structure of the project on the next weeks. Then we're going to focus on the code for it to actually work. But you're going to start to think about this that you're going to make some kind of tap interactive game where there's going to be either simply taps on the screen to do something. There's going to be some amount of this key should be put into this door or this um, spaceship should touch this spaceport, right? Hit detection. There's going to be some of that. There's going to be some of um, basic time limit. Did you do something in the amount of time? Uh, so various navigation from screen to screen, various little animations that happen on the screen. That's all tying together into a game. So let's take a break. It's one o'clock, back at 110. And then I'll show you, further show you this game and setting up the project. 10.
All right, everyone, let's say it's close enough to 110, so I'm going to continue. Um, I'll show a little bit of the code of this project, and this is, again, that you are uh, you're going to do your own version of, of this project, and everyone's kind of starting on the same footing. You can go beyond. The very first one that I showed was the one that's a little bit more beyond. This one is a little bit more in terms of what you'll have to do for the assignment. Um, it's still going to be complex, but not as much as the other one. Um, so we're going to see this code again in a little bit when we actually start to add the code, but just to kind of break it down, the ideas of interactive buttons that take you to various scenes. So again, on this particular scene, all that this one has is a little bit of text. There's a button to click on. This button, interactive element, is an instance of the home symbol. And it has a, a um, instance name. So if this is instance of home um, in the library, alphabetically, there's the there's the home icon symbol. So it's called home. Now again, the names of these things. Okay, there's help, home, horse, milk, menu, pitchfork. These things can be named anything you want, of course, but maybe the things that are related on a screen or on a concept have a specific syntax, a prefix and the like. So maybe on the home screen, all of the things here, okay, let's see this. This is help, this is play, uh, this is help, this is play. So these in the library could be named something like SC1 help, SC1 play, scene one help, button, scene one, play button. They are named simply play and help, which if that's fine for your code to work, that's fine. You can name these things ABC if you want, but it'll help you to name these things a little bit more meaningfully. Now there's the name of the object in the library. So all of these pieces there organized. Notice basically everything that is also interactive is a symbol. If it's a symbol, it can then further be animated and such. But everything that's going to be interacted with, make a note of that, everything that will be interacted with will be a symbol. And so these have a name in the library, and then they also need a name on screen. Because you might have, um, you might have, more than one copy of something on the screen, that's fine. Maybe you've got three torches on the screen and they all come from the one torch graphic and they're all flickering and such, but only one of them is the one you actually interact with. Consider that. That's a reason also to have things as symbols. Well, in order for the code to know, and I'm going to use that sort of personification of things. In order for the code to know, the code doesn't do anything. It's an inanimate object. In order for you to properly program it, we need to give it an instance name so that we know which thing we're clicking on. This particular instance has no instance name. This instance, this copy of the thing does have an instance name. And here it's named meaningfully, welcome help button. On the welcome screen, I'm currently on my welcome screen, there is a help object, and it's a button. It's an interactive thing. So this is a better name here. The prefix of the scene plus then the name of that particular object, and then an extension to perhaps remind you further what it is. Is it a, is it a button? Is it a draggable thing? Is it a character? Is it a background? These names you will see in the beginning, you'll probably think of obvious names, but then as you further work in your project, you should think of more specific names, names with a pattern so that they make sense to you. 
And as you're working on the project within, within, these, within these few weeks, you're gonna see it over and over. But what if you put it aside after the semester's over and you say, that was hard, it was cool, but I don't wanna look at this now. I'm done, I gotta change gears. And then you come back to it a week later, a month later, a year later, you have to remember your own code. Well, if you gave yourself the hints within the code of the names of things, that is very helpful. The uh, play button, it's an instance of play in the library, but on the screen, on the welcome screen, this play button exists. Because I could use that same play in multiple scenes and in order for the different code to sort of be attached to the right button, it's all about the instance name. By tapping on help, it takes me to help screen. On the help screen, the only interactive thing is that, that has a instance name title menu. Now here, this, these names can be anything. For me, I would have called it help back button. Because I'm on the help screen, I want to go back to the title. They named it title menu button. For the logic for them, it was, okay, this is the button that's going to be clicked on to take me back to the menu or the, the title screen. The scene itself is called welcome, not title. The button on it says title. So for them, the logic of it was title menu button. And if the code works, it works. It can be called ABC kitty cat. And if it works, it works. But for yourself, Think about those things logically. After the play button is pressed, we then go to a scene that looks very similar to the um, to the welcome screen, but without the interactive elements. And unless it was programmed, it'll just simply be we're here, then we're here. There's no fade, there's no movement, there's no, it just happens. This is again, you have to think about all the details. So what if? Before I simply go to that first frame, I have the, the, the name of the, the game, Barn Trap, and the buttons. What if I have them visible for a moment and they slowly fade away, alpha zero? What if I have you know one second of animation first that plays of the text disappearing or fading away, then stop here to interact with the game? This one... And this is not a put down or anything. This one is more of a beginner version, a basic version compared to the first one that I saw. I wish I had shown that first one later. I didn't remember these games, but that first one that I showed you was one of the more advanced ones. And not that this is bad or anything like that. Basic is not a negative here. This is an A plus assignment. It's got the everything working right. But comparatively to a little bit of the extra stuff of the first night game. It's a little simpler, but still a very good grade. So we get to the door scene. What are the elements on screen here? The barn background. There's a bunny layer. Yes. Here's the bunny. There's a layer for the bunny, but then, oh, there it is. So it's outside of the game, and then eventually it'll play and come onto the screen. It, it, it goes behind on this empty spot here. But there is a bunny layer with a bunny object. It's bunny in the um, library on the screen. It's bunny MC. Maybe if this were called, you know, scene one, bunny MC, to further tell me, oh, this is the bunny. This bunny is doing something on this particular scene because I can have a copy of this bunny in many scenes. And so this is an MC, a movie clip. The other one was a button that you were clicking on. This one is a movie clip, some bit of animation that is happening in the library. Bunny MC. Is animated with a few simple frame by frame animations. Do it for some reason also, like it's behind the door. I would have drawn it completely and just relied on the other layers to hide it.
So this has a little bit of animation, but it's not going to uh, It's not going to animate by itself. The door to interact with. So we call layer two, which is just a little bit. What is that? I guess just some. something there. There's like a piece of something there that was drawn and maybe forgotten about. And then the code. So the code, you can see that we're going to have various sound. You can play various sounds on various scenes. Um, we'll, we'll see some code about stopping any previous music. So I've got some cool music happening on my title screen, my help screen, but then when the game begins, stop any previous music, stop the animation from happening here. There's a door that is interactive. It's a door that's interactive. And what's going to happen is you've got a door, um, movie clip that is going to play. So this will animate opening up the next scene inside the barn. You've got here multiple paths to take, left, right, and also a, a sort of a um, an interactive element that doesn't really do anything, but is there to kind of do the world building. You'll be able to move this pitchfork, and you would think, well, what do I do with a pitchfork? Probably work with the hay. So the code the code the pitch fork is going to be movable there will be boundaries basically the size of of the screen i'm going to write code to detect once i tap it once i'm kind of dragging it around what do i do what happens when i let it go so here when you work, when you play someone's game, it's all properly programmed, but you have to program it to detect, I'm dragging something, do something. I've let go dragging it, do something else. So as I'm moving it around, there is code happening there that is um, keeping it within the boundaries. Basically, I'm not gonna let it go outside of the game somehow. So as I'm moving it around, keep track of where is this object? Don't let it go outside the boundaries. When I let it go, this code triggers here where it will then um, check, let's check, did this object touch that object? If this pitchfork has hit, has touched, has been put on top of the haystack object, play the movie clip, of the haystack. The haystack movie clip is just a little shake, maybe it has a sound as well. And so if this pitchfork is put on top of the haystack, there's the code to detect, or else they didn't touch, don't do anything. Here's some AI happening. If we detect that the pitchfork touches the haystack, play the animation of the haystack, or else if they didn't touch, don't do anything. The haystack. Probably haystack. Yep, right there. So the haystack itself, it's just a little bit of wiggling around, some frame by frame, moving it a little, resizing it just a little bit, something with a little bit of sound as well. This is this is nice. This is yes, this is the, the basic version of the game, but it still has cool things because even here, um, 
you've got a movie clip, movie clips that can have their own timeline, can have their own interactivity and such. And so movie clips themselves can have code. Don't play this animation. Show the haystack on the screen, but don't have it constantly wiggling. Show the haystack, stop it at that frame. We saw on the previous code, if we detect the pitchfork, touch the haystack, movie, haystack movie clip, play. So it'll get past frame one and it'll go here. It'll play the sound. It'll wiggle a little. It'll get to final frame there. And the code says stop there. Don't have it loop over and over, wiggle the whole time. See, on the one hand, this is very cool, very smart. On the other hand, it's very simple. There's some little wiggle animation on this movie clip, but it's not going to wiggle constantly, not until something else triggers it to jump past the stop, wiggle one time, stop wiggling. And you've got an interactive element here, an interactive element here. Now, see how the... Break it down this way. There was the whole drawing of the background. Parts are going to be interactive. They're going to be clickable and such. So here on its own separate layer, right? Because there's the whole background. But in its own layer is a copy of those lines that's turned into its own symbol. That has a... Uh, that has a name on the timeline, that has a name on the screen, stairs up button. Anything that needs to be interactive needs to be a symbol, it needs to have an instance name, and then the code. The code here then says, there's some stairs, there's a stairs button. Listen for a tap. When we hear the tap, run more code. In this case, again, from the current screen that we are currently looking at, go to and play frame one of my scene upstairs. There's a gate. Listen for tapping it. If we detect tapping of that, go to gate code, and this is saying play the animation of the gate. This gate, there's things that are simply tap once they work. We can also tap it, interact with it multiple times, and when it's once it detects, okay, you, you tried twice, now do it, like that one. It, the gate is kind of stuck. That's the idea. The gate is kind of stuck. You tap it once, it kind of wiggles, it's it looks like it's interactive. I tap it again and okay, I, I, I got it loose. So the gate itself has as these animations of wiggling with some creaking sound, the code, when we get to the scene, don't animate the gate wiggling. Stop it here. Then now we're going to keep track of how many times have, have you tried to open the door? The code here is saying zero. We haven't tried to open the door yet. This is a, known as a variable. It's keep track, it keeps track of data. So we haven't moved the door yet. Zero times. We've interacted with the door zero times. You tap on the door one time. The other code said, okay, play. Break out of that. Stop. Go to the next frame. So. The next frame, frame two, add one number to the gate. Zero plus one becomes one. Then it detects how many times have we tapped on the gate? If we've tapped on it more than twice, do something. If we've not tapped on it more than twice, do something else is known as an if else statement, a conditional statement, a, a sort of a test, a little bit of AI. We've never touched the gate, so the gate is zero. Is zero greater than two? Nope, do nothing. If we tap on it one time, zero becomes one. 
Now it checks. Is one greater than two? Nope. Do nothing. Tap on it again. One plus one is two. Is two greater than two? No, two is the same as two. Two is not greater than two. Two is the same as two. Is two greater than two? Nope. Do this part. Do nothing. Tap it one more time. We get three. Two plus one is three. Is three greater than two? Yes. We've tapped the gate enough times. We've, we've wiggled it enough times. Now, in my current scene, in my current movie, go to frame 11. So there's kind of a loop happening here from here to here, over and over, over and over, over and over, until we get to frame 11. Seems to be frame 10, actually. But then on frame, oh, okay, yeah. So it's gonna wiggle and jump back to the beginning. Wiggle, jump back, wiggle, jump back. On the third wiggle, it's just gonna skip to 11. Little wiggling. But finally, at that point, they should have animated that it was also opened. Um, yeah, I'm gonna fix their, I'm gonna fix this thing here. After we jump to eleven, let's say Say I'm going to animate it like this. It's opening. There's the wiggling, trying to open it. It's going to detect you haven't tried hard enough. Eventually, it detects, OK, you tried hard enough. Let's open it. So let's see my little change here in their project. This is the part about as you work on your own project, you're going to have to go through your own code, your own project over and over. This is normal. And so you can have those shortcuts about um, and I move the <laughs> I move the stairs over there. So here we go. I tap it once. Got a little wiggle. Wiggle happened too fast. But did you see it? It opened up. It animated too fast because I didn't have enough frames, too many keyframes, or not enough keyframes. So it kind of went really fast. But you see, there was a little bit of an open. And I guess we're stuck here. There's no way to go back. So maybe I can fix it there. But this. This open happened way too fast. Um, so let's do this. Let's give it uh, our frames to slow it down. And when it gets to the end here, ultimately when it plays these frames of it opening up, it then hits frame whatever, 22. In frame 22 code, I can tell there's code there. There's a little A for action. That then says, okay, stop this animation from my current screen, move me to scene one of the horse. I've slowed down the animation, less frames, faster animation. Um, more frames, slower animation. One tap. Two taps, there we go. So I, I would have to f further slow it down. I'd have to put it in the right position and so forth. But um, see how I have now a door opening up there. A horse scene. How's this set up? So we've got a layer two. Remember to name your layers. I guess that's the main background. Side on the left, okay. We've got the actual horse on its own layer. We've got a window on the right side. We've got a chicken. <laughs> food trough, food log, and the code. 
the code on this scene, stop as soon as we get here, set up some boundaries for the food, because we're gonna move the thing around. See again, the same kind of like five codes over and over, but then they do different things when you put them together. I'm gonna move an object. Previously, I moved the pitchfork. I needed to define the boundaries of the pitchfork. You can only move the pitchfork around the screen. You could set it up that the, that the item is only movable inside of a box. Right here, this is saying you can move anywhere from zero to the size of the, of the stage width. You can move from zero to the size of the height. I could set it here. Uh, no, only let me move my object, you know, 200 pixels to the right. Only let me move my object 123 pixels down. But the code here is saying, based on your project's width and height, let me move that object anywhere that I want within the screen. Detect when the food trough is being moved. Detect when I'm no longer moving it. When I'm moving it around, only keep it inside of the boundaries. Again, coding is a whole other language, like you're lo learning Italian or Russian or Hebrew or Japanese. It's a whole language. It's a programming language. But you'll start to look at it and learn it and memorize the things that we do over and over. In English, you often say the same things over and over, to or the or and. There's the details that you're saying. There's the details that you're saying whenever you say the words. And the same thing with the programming language. We're see, we've seen this a couple of times. And the good thing about learning this, if you're seeing right now, well, this is going to be so hard. Am I going to be able to do my game in the three weeks that I've got left? Yes and no. Yes, you'll be able to do the, ver the basic version of it. Are you going to be able to do everything on your vision? No, no one does. That's fine. But if you get one thing working, you're going to be able to do that over and over. If I can get a button to work on my first screen, screen, I'm going to be able to get it to work on my 90 screens because they all do the exact same thing. Listen for a tab and do stuff. If I need to drag things around and I get that working once, it'll work a hundred more times. I define some boundaries, usually the whole screen. I then um, pay attention to holding it, pay attention to dropping it, and then deal with holding it, deal with dropping it. And I move the trough around. Okay, drag this thing around. If, if this object is detected that it hits the background or the window, play the chicken. If I didn't, so that means I could put it on top of the horse. So this is saying if you, that's why the background is divided into a piece of the background and a piece of the window. Interesting. So here, if you throw the trough, if you drop the trough anywhere on the floor, this means or, or if you drop it on the window, the chicken attacks you or else nothing happens. So if you put it on the horse, nothing happens. Um, so itself is supposed to be play the timeline of barn door in barn door and then takes us to barn window play huh well anyway so i i could have set it up here that if it touches the floor the wind the chicken attacks you if the trough touches the window something else could happen it wasn't programmed to do that we have this else nothing here saying both of those do the same thing play the chicken this says window if you tap the window directly play the animation of the window if you touch the horse, play the anim do do the horse code, which is just play the horse. See that. So on window, window itself thing. It was never fully programmed. This from the note, it seemed to say that if you touch the window, it would take you back outside, but it was never fully programmed, so it didn't do anything. That's okay. You, you don't have uh, time to do everything. The other one was the horse. So it just plays the, the horse whinny. That bear at home. 
So by default, the horse is not doing anything. That symbol is stopped. The other code detected. I tapped the horse. So on the horse symbol, play, frame two. Frame two, the music starts, which is just a sound effect. It gets to the end. It automatically loops back to the beginning unless I program it otherwise. So when we get to the end of the timeline, it automatically loops back to the start. It then hits again the stop command so it doesn't keep winning over and over and over. This was here and then the... Um, the trough. So we had the chicken. What's the chicken doing? Chicken symbol. When, when the scene starts up, the chicken is in this position, stop right there. If I do move the trough and put it somewhere else out of the way, hit detection detected that, and that said chicken play. So we're gonna then skip to here and have some sounds, I guess, of a chicken angry. Some basic frame-by-frame uh, -frame animation here. Laying down, head comes up, move at you, move it, move it, move it, redraw it, wings open, angry face, wings down, up, down, up, making it bigger and bigger frame-by-frame -frame animation. Music plays, hits frame 44, what's on 44? From this current view, take us to the bad ending. So you see, you can have movie clips doing their thing, and then when they trigger code, they have something else happen. We'll see this code over and over. We are at a current scene. This is all basically saying the current scene, wherever we're currently at. Dot, go to and play, take us somewhere else. If we had it only listed like that, in the current, well, let's say like this, in the current view, in the current symbol, in the current place in our game, go to frame whatever, frame 22. If we have a frame plus a comma, quotes, quotes name of the scene, so I've got 10 scenes, 10 games to play, 10 screens to go into, take me to a specific frame, comma, of a specific scene. So that one go to and play or go to and stop, I can have this as a stop, automatically take me somewhere, stop me right there on some other screen. You see this is versatile bit of code here, but this will not happen until the chicken attacks you. The chicken is calm here. If you move the trough out of the way, the chicken animation plays. It does all of this. It screams at you. It hits that trigger. It takes you to the bad ending. Bad ending. And then here's just uh, a bunch of static imagery with code. Stop any previous music. Stop on this screen. Listen for tapping the return button. Listen for tapping the exit button. Play some new music on this screen. If we play the um, if we play if we want to play again, Actually, this one's, oh yeah, here it is. If we, if we don't want to play anymore, there's code here to exit the game. If we want to play again, if we want to try one more time, if we detect tapping the return button, the code called return, and this is the part where you can make this up where it's kitty cat. And then our code here, kitty cat. We detect a button being pressed run my original code called kitty cat. And the definition of kitty cat is to do one or 100 commands. There's only one command here. From the current view, go somewhere where frame one 
of scene one. Or else if you tap the exit button, run some code, whatever, these have to match. If that looks like that, that doesn't match that, therefore it won't work. Here we're coding detect something. If that happens, do something. What's the something? Here. This is not the same name, so it's not going to match, but now it matches. And what this says basically, okay, exit the app. Just quit the app off of the device or close the screen with the app. If we do restart, there's some code in here dealing with music and so forth and the current music and all this other stuff. We'll look at that later. If instead from barn, I go upstairs, it's a whole upstairs scene here with various interactive elements. The code part is the important part. So stop on this first place, set up detecting going to the stairs, set up the boundaries of dr dragging that carrot around, set up what happens as you drag the carrot, set up what happens as you let go of the carrot. See, that looks exactly the same as before, but the difference is now we're paying attention to the carrot. We're paying attention to the pitchfork. We're paying attention to the trough. We're paying attention to the, to the chicken, but the same code define boundaries, deal with moving the object, dealing with letting go of the object, stopping on this screen so that the animation doesn't play automatically, setting up a listener to a basic tap, set up code to move from screen to screen. You see that I'm already showing you the five or six bits of code that we do over and over. On the one hand, it's very nice. Coding can be very nice because it can be repetitive. If you get something working, you repeat that and change it a little and you get something else working. On the other hand, it's repetitive, it's annoying, it's mechanical. And for some of us, the repetition is nice. Maybe my mentality, my logic, my personality, repetition is nice for me. For other people, repetition is the most boring thing ever. So in this kind of second half of the class where we've done a lot of the artistic side of the class and a lot of you seem to like that, now we're going to the less artistic part and some of you will like that maybe you weren't artistic maybe it was all stick figures that's fine but then you're going to shine on this part maybe you're going to do stuff above and beyond like the first example that i showed they did things that i didn't even cover in class because they wanted to go further and learn more and look up the the code and add more but this is more in line of what all of you are going to do nothing about oh what's the pattern of the blocks put the pattern in the right way that one was beyond i'm not really going to cover that and what else did that other person do? Oh, the other person also did uh, touch the um, touch the shovel to the grave, open up the grave, load another object dynamically from the library, get the corpse, put it on that, put the dirt on top of that. We're not going to do that either. That's multiple levels of hit detection. We're not really going to do that. But based on the hit detection we do know here a little bit of, you might be able to get that working. What is this doing? Uh, if you move that carrot keep it within the boundaries. Once you let go of the carrot, what are we doing here? If the carrot touched the floor, so here's hit detection. If the carrot touched the floor, play the rabbit. The box is also movable. We've got two things movable on this screen, a carrot and a box. What do we do as the box moves? What do we do when we let go of the box? As we move the box, keep it in the boundaries. When we let go of the box, okay. If this box touches the carrot, not the rabbit, but the carrot. Okay, if the box touches the carrot, In theory, it should be touching the rabbit. But I guess where, wherever you put the carrot, the rabbit will come out? Hmm. We'll test that in a moment. So what I'm seeing here is if this box touches the carrot, further, if the box touches the full, it's to touch both of these things. So I guess, oops, I guess if you move the carrot, on top of the table. Hmm. 
All right, so we have two detections. If the box also touches the floor, move us to scene movie. What is scene movie again? Scene movie is scene movie. Scene movie is what is this? Oh yeah, yeah. Scene movie is the <laughs> is the. Uh, Fox reaching in to grab rabbit, missing its head. So we're upstairs. Two detections going on. Did I delete all the code? Did I select and delete everything on accident? So always save your work just in case. Of your work. All right, so the box, if it detects the carrot and the floor, go to my movie scene, I would have called that capture, my capture scene. There's also the milk that's interactive. If you tap the milk, the milk, milk plays, which I guess is just a, Plus a little sound of glass tapping. We go over to the movie scene, the capture scene. So what is here? This is a stop. This is a stop, but then there is a background and a box. This is a box of box open in box open here this is its own complex animation that was incomplete which will happen no problem but basically little frame by frame as well as tweening the head is missing the legs are missing the tail is missing Final frame holding the rabbit triumphantly. When we when we hit upon frame 57 from the current scene, take us to the good ending, frame one. So all of this of uh, breaking down a previous student's work is to show you the different kinds of games that they did and that the code that they worked on that all of you will work on, all of you are going to learn like the same 10 lines of code or whatever. It'll then be up to you to create these scenes and so forth and the idea and so forth and the interactivity. I have one more to show. I guess what I was planning for today was to show the examples of student work, break down their code a little bit, and then um, start to set up the project and then the actual coding next time. So I'll show one more, break this down a little bit, and then um, start to set up the code project. So let's play this one. Again, I'm playing it without sound for you. This is Robotic Dreams. Actually, this one, the problem with this one is I don't think they set their project up properly because it didn't pop up. Control, test movie, okay, uh, deep dogger mobile. Here we go. Do you remember to turn on this touch layer? It's so. Intro screen, no extra stuff happening here, just intro screen, that's perfectly fine. I'm not looking for a lot of artistry, I'm looking for the logical programming of it. 
click help, click around to interact. Some items may be movable. Try to drag and drop. Good luck. All right, I know what to do now. So I go back, start screen, start. I have some, um, some screen here, tapping on the door, nothing happens. There's a key here that I can move. There's also like a brick here, I suppose, not interactive. So probably, probably put the key on the door. So the key on the door takes us to the next scene. Of course, it could be animated with the door opening up, music playing, zooming in, all that artistry. I'm looking more for the coding of things. I would definitely recommend that you do the coding first and then go back in and do the artistry. If it's just simple lines like this on version one, perfect. If you then have time before the deadline, jazz it up. But if it looks amazing and it doesn't work, you're not gonna get a good grade. Unfortunately, that other one that I showed with all those amazingly drawn characters, that's an F. The game didn't work. The part about the artistry and the movie and such, that's the other project. This project is the code must work. We have some outlets. I got shocked and I guess I'm dead. So this is again about these types of games. These are more like vintage games where things just kill you without, this, what do they call it? Nintendo, Nintendo hard, right? Original Nintendo where there, were, there was no mercy. And if you didn't do it right, you're dead. Do it again. Kid, you've got all day long. Well, okay, let me do it again. Got to go in here. Got to make sure not to touch that. That'll probably kill me. If I go straight ahead, I'm in some other screen here with a bed, I guess. What can I do here? Tap the bed and I'm blissed out. Okay. So great. That was a good ending, I guess. You can program in hidden things. Just tapping around to see if there's hidden things. I guess it's just the bed. That's it, okay. What about any other paths? Let's take to the right. Nothing. What about the left? What a hidden spot. And when you're making your own game in your mind, you have all these great ideas and there's going to be a hidden thing over here and no one's ever going to think about interacting with your hidden thing. It's too hidden. What's the classic thing on video games where there's a perfectly designed wall, but on one corner of the wall, the brick is slightly different. Hey, interact with that. Here, maybe I could have, if I've got wallpaper, maybe there's a little bit of wallpaper that is slightly peeled. It's the only part of the background with a peeled piece of wallpaper. Maybe interact with that. Maybe all of the wall is painted yellow, but then it looks like a little square there that is slightly different yellow because there might've been a painting there before, but it's got taken away now. That paint is slightly different, interact with that. This is a thing, yeah, it's an outlet. I probably want to plug something in there. I probably don't want to touch it directly, but whoops, I touched it directly and it killed me. Do I want it to kill me right away? Do I want to have hit points? Do I want to do this, this and that? Yes, do I have the time for it? No. If at least the um, game doesn't um, have basic functionality, it's not going to get a good grade. Artistry, artistry wise, you know, it's basic stick figures, but I'm not grading on that. Does the game work? Can you go to multiple screens? Do you have some amount of interactivity as per the assignment? Yes, probably this got a good grade. So the, uh, the code, let's break this down a little bit on the, Title scene, so they name this title, help, door, hall, bed, good and bad ending. So I've got all these various scenes. You're gonna have multiple ones. I think at least five scenes, maybe six. Uh, it's not gonna be a three scene thing and you're done. You are gonna create, I think around five or six scenes, definitely a title, definitely a help, definitely good and bad ending. So that's four scenes. 
and then stuff in between. I think I have at least one more in between scene. So at least five scenes. How much visual interest is up to you. We're going to have the code about um, make sure that your make sure that the project just doesn't automatically play on its own. The stop command. We're going to have a requirement of interacting with buttons. This kind of code here. See, we're seeing it over and over. Something that is interactive, do something. Something that is interactive, do something. Over to the help screen. Stop on this screen. Something to interact with, do something. Door screen, a little bit more code. Not a huge amount, but stop the animation. Set up boundaries for some object. We've seen this over and over. Zero to width, zero to height. There's something that we're going to be able to drag when we touch in, when we touch end. As we move it around, keep it in the boundaries. We let it go. Let's detect stuff. Let's detect if things are touching. What things? Well, did the key hit the door? If it didn't, nothing happened. If it did, something else happened. The door animation and move to scene. Yeah, the brick. The brick is supposed to do something. Um, this doesn't look quite right, but I guess it's just the sound of the brick. Uh, I guess it's just the sound playing. You're trying to move the brick. It's not really going to do much. It's just the sound of bricks moving, I guess. So you can have things that are interactive that do nothing and things that are interactive that do something. Maybe I'm trying to open that door and that door will never open, but it plays a sound or whatever, like the horse. The horse was interactive on the other game. It just whinnied at you, but it didn't do anything. The trough, the food trough was interactive and movable. So you can have things that are interactive, but don't do anything. I would say don't rely on that too much, again, because in your mind, it's a, it's a great game experience. But in the person playing for the first time, like, am I is something supposed to happen with this brick? Is something supposed to happen with this horse? Do I, do I need to put the brick on the horse? Right, this, this kind of game can be very uh, esoteric in terms of like, what do I even do? in a project, in this, in this game. But if the door plays, door, one of these two, okay, that door. Don't call, don't call something door MC and something doors MC. Uh, you should further name them uh, scene one door, scene two door, or title screen door and main lab door. These names are way too similar. But on that door scene, what happens is, I guess they were going to tween it so that it would open up. But once it hits that line there, go to the hall. And so forth. I'm not going to further break it all down. We've seen plenty of that. We've seen the same code over and over about interactivity. I'm curious though, what else is on this bed scene? It's simply tap the bed, win the game. Okay, that's fine. It's not a 40 hour game where you learn about humanity and yourself, but it is interactive. It moves around different screens, interactivity, it's coding. Maybe this person was interested more in the art of things, not the coding of things. They got the coding stuff done and now I'll never deal with that again but that's what I'm looking for for this next big project, the actual game side, the actual coding stuff. The art side of it is important, of course, but start with stick figures. And then later on, because it's all symbols, you'll be able to further keep editing it to make it perfect. So 
like this one, we had the headless, we had the headless uh, fox, which can be added later. I'm not going to deduct points on that, that it, the fox looks scary because the code worked. Moving from screen to screen, getting to different endings and such, that all worked. So on the final half hour of the class or so, I'm going to go through setting up the project. Nothing of coding at the moment, but just setting up the basics of the project. So that next week we can start to work on the project. Now, on the next weeks, we are going to be learning to make the game. We're going to be learning the code. So you're kind of, as you're following along, you're going to be working on the final project. And if you're able to get it to work as we're in class, you're getting there to get the game to work, the final project. Um, I don't know if this is easy to do here, but if I turn the camera around here, look at all of the amazing students that came in today to get work done. I would recommend you come to class to get stuff done, to work on our tablets, uh, and to get help from the assistants that might also be here next time because this stuff is going to be hard. You're going to miss a comma and it won't work. You're going to add two quotes instead of one and it's not going to work. You're going to type, I swear I typed my boundaries, but you type the lowercase r instead of a capital R and it's not going to work. This is going to be a very frustrating part of things if you are not a big logical person, a big right brain person, whatever it is, left brain, right brain, I don't remember which is which, but if you're not into the logic of things, into the programming of things, into the mechanical aspect of things, this is going to be hard. We've shown you three or four examples of people that were on the same boat as you, a summer class, very fast, uh, zero, zero to 60 very quickly, but they got it done, except that one example that they spent more time on the drawings instead of the code. And even if it's very basic looking and not your complete vision, you'll probably still get a good grade because you did the minimum that I'm asking for. So to start up the project, make sure you've added into animate the SDK file, which I showed last time, create new. Even if you have an iPhone at home, I would still like for in order for me to properly grade it and such, please select the advanced Android project, even though you have an iPhone. Um, to be able to follow along and work and to see the results in class here, I've got Android phones for you, not iPhones, so you need to set Android. When I grade it and such, it's also a lot easier for me to grade. It can be converted between the two later, but just for the learning process, Android. We are going to do the game landscape. So proceeding here, switch these around, 800 by 480. Frame rate is fine. Pixels is fine. So this is step one of your final project. Make sure it's an Android, 800 by 480. Flip those around. You might say, ah, but I want it to be vertical. Nope. Enjoy your deducted points. Make it landscape. Create. To save my project. To save my project, to change my background color to anything else. I need to set some behind the scenes stuff, file, Android settings.
Android settings. Output file can be anything you want. App name, you probably want your last name or the name of your project. This will be like uh, Kitty Adventure. Here's an important thing. Even though I set the dimensions of the project a moment ago to be landscape, the project is the, itself is still set to portrait. People make this mistake and then they lose points. Just because you set those pixels doesn't mean it's going to then be output properly. So make sure you set that to landscape. Set some language, probably English. Permissions, turn on internet. Icons, we'll deal with that later. Deployment, nothing to do here just yet. We're not actually finishing the project yet. So nothing to do on deployment. But on this screen, at the very least, set your landscape properly, your language and your permissions. Okay. Then we're gonna set up some scenes. Scene panel, SC. I'm gonna recommend that you call your scenes um, with the prefix of SC because you're gonna write code that references either symbols or scenes or labels, I'll cover that later. And when you're looking at it, just the code, if something is called milk, okay, it's probably an object that I can interact with called milk, but I might have a level where I'm in the milk zone and I called the scene milk. I wouldn't quite know quickly on my code, am I dealing with an object or am I dealing with a scene? What am I dealing with? By prefixing, various well-known um, things and such, then the, um, the code, you can be able to differentiate them. So S, SC for scene, or call it scene. You can put spaces, but I don't recommend spaces. Keep it all together. You can do underscores for readability. You can do all lowercase. You can do capital letter. Just avoid the spaces. SC, scene one, scene one, scene title. This is the scene where the title of my game will appear. And within your layers here, background, actions. You're going to have definitely more layers than that, but at the very least, an actions layer, capital A at the top, a background layer. And I will say again, anything that's interactive, it, it's better to have it on its own layer. So I might have the basic background that just exists, but then a path is on its own layer. We'll get to that. But some basic setup like this. Now, this could be a good starting point for future scenes. So instead of taking the, the long way, I could use a shortcut here. Instead of creating a new scene, which will also need a background layer and will also need an actions layer, why not duplicate a scene that already has some of my layers? I need to change the name, of course. Scene title, nope, this will be scene help. That already has my actions and my background. Basically every screen, interactive screen of your game will have actions, will have some code and some visual element. So from here, I might as well set up, at least like I said, you're gonna have a title screen, a help screen, a main screen of action. Bad ending and a good ending.
So I've got five scenes at least to go to. Lots of stuff can happen on those scenes. You can make more than these if you want. In the homework, I believe these will be at the least, at the minimum that you need. I don't want to help screen. I want them to figure it out. Good. Enjoy your not A plus because you didn't follow instructions. And it's not me being mean and stifling your vision of creativity. It is when we had our, our guest speaker, he worked in the real world game design. And if the bosses say, I need that, and you don't do that, congratulations on not working here anymore. So it's not that I'm trying to be mean. It is that these are the requirements of the project. And if you get hired for a certain project and you don't do that project, then you don't continue in your employment. Never mind a grade, you don't continue on the job and get the paycheck and pay the rent. So the requirements and such are going to be there. You can add to the requirements, but never remove requirements. And maybe within these requirements and boundaries and such, maybe you'll find fun things to do for your own creativity. So of course, when I give the assignment out, the final project, all the details will be there. Make sure you do the details. I'm already kind of previewing things that will be there. The various scenes, they have a good name, no spaces. They have a meaningful name, title screen, help screen, main screen, whatever. This is fine. Now, slightly better to name these actually would be scene ending bad and scene ending good. Both will give you the right result in the end. These two are slightly better named in that when we deal with computers, computers are very logical, they're very dumb, they are um, very mechanical. So, for example, the date, 7 19 23. In the US, we usually look at dates like this 7 19 23. Great. The seventh month, the 19th day, the 2023rd year of the common era. Well, if I have, if these were files, 7 19 23 dot JPEG, 720. 2023.jpg, 72123.jpg. If I had a folder full of pictures that were named month, day, year, they're going to get out of order. Logically, I know that the eighth month comes next and the sixth month is previous. But then when we have 10, oftentimes with organization of files, a one and a 10 is next to each other because it's one and a zero, one and then a two. So for organization, if we instead name the file 23-719 JPEG, 23-720 JPEG, 23-721 JPEG, the organization of the year 2023 will all be organized first and then the months, then the days. So over here, SC bad, SC good, then endings. The organization of it isn't logical enough in that we're dealing with endings because we might have a medium ending. We might have an okay ending. We might have a 75% ending, a 25% ending. We have these various endings. We could have ending of you know, 50%, don't really write percent there, 50p. We can have a 50, well, let's say a 51% completion like that. These are all grouped together. These are all endings, number one. The big idea is that they're all endings. And then the sub idea is that it's the bad ending, the good ending, and the medium ending. Just the order of those things is a slight thing that matters logically and the like, tech-wise and the like that for regular people, there's like no difference. They're both the same thing. Ending bad versus bad ending, same thing. And it makes more sense as the person, bad ending. But we're not dealing with a person, we're dealing with a dumb computer. We're dealing with the concept of endings, which could be bad, good, medium, et cetera. So again, this is why the logic side of this class, for some people, yeah, I love it. Logic, uh, technology, programming, I love it. 
for the people, uh, I want to go back to the drawing. I'm going to spend all my time making that perfect iceberg. And then I run out of time and I don't program it. And then I get an F. So the logic side of things can be very techy, very, very um, logical. So over the weekend, I know you're still working on your movie. I would highly recommend that you don't use up, don't, don't use up all your time working on the movie stuff. Your homework over the weekend, by Monday, is to um, create a project just like I did. Make sure it's an Android project. Make sure it's landscape. Make sure you set your settings there on the settings. Make five, uh, make five screens, name them those things and then start putting a little bit of content there. On what your movie is, if your movie ends in a to be continued, how will it continue to be this little adventure quest thing? We saw a knight going through the mausoleum to get a sword. We saw a fox trying to catch a rabbit. We saw robot dreams, a robot trying to find a bed. We saw that one about those furry characters with diamonds or something. So. What is your game going to do within these scenes? Minimum these scenes. We're, we're probably going to have two or three more scenes beyond the, the, the main scene of action. But at the very least, by Monday, next, next lecture, you want to start putting a little bit of content here. At the very least, the backgrounds, the various screens you're going to look at. No, don't worry just yet about the characters or the interactive elements and such. You could if you've got a good idea so far. But at the very least, by Monday, start to populate these screens. What text am I going to show on my screen? What help am I going to give on the help screen? Maybe the background that I created for my movie is going to be on my main scene. I have that script that I figured out previously. I have the Drabble. I have what I wrote about the character. I have the movie storyboard. Maybe I have those eight drawings of the storyboard but I'm going to do the six drawings in my movie. And then on the final two drawings of my storyboard, those might be what I do in my game. And so then I have some idea of a good ending and bad ending. We might have a medium ending if we have time, if you have time, after we learn how to move around on screens, after we learn how to pick up objects, after we learn how to test for interactivity after we learn how to add music per scene, after we add, learn how to add music on interactive objects, we've got this game coming together that'll wrap up your epic of your movie. And, and again, just to say it one more time, the final day of class, the final lecture, Wednesday the 9th, yeah, three weeks, no, not the, not the 9th, the 2nd, Wednesday the 2nd, two weeks, and then the final, final, final deadline is the sixth. Look at a calendar. There's not a huge amount of time, but we will learn what we need to learn on the next four class meetings times two and a half hours. What is that? Five, that's 10 hours. 10 hours of, of, of lecture still coming up. Two and a half hours per day, four days, 10 hours. Plus any work that you do on your own, plus the lab time we will have on Wednesdays for about an hour. You're only doing this at home, you'll probably be okay, but be advised again that this is harder to do from home because when you need help at that moment, I might not be able to answer. I'm teaching three other classes. The assistants might not be available right away to help you because they're helping three other people. So keep that in mind. We have this big classroom here with lots of help and such. Um, take advantage of it. So I'm going to wrap up at this point. That's your homework for Monday. Set up the basics of your project in the right way. As I showed here, replay the video if you want. And then we'll start to learn about the coding on Monday.